Welcome, everyone. I'm Eric Green, director of the National Human Genome Research Institute, which is part of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. I'm delighted to kick off this symposium with some opening remarks. Over the next two days, we're going to talk about the many dimensions of sex and gender as it relates to genomics. Specifically, we will use a genomic lens to explore the complexities of sex assignments, sex characteristics, the relationships with gender, all within the context of the ever-growing knowledge about genomics. Exploring these issues is critical for pursuing basic research that is relevant to human health, which is at the core of NIH's mission. Improving our collective understanding of these complex topics is also essential to ensuring that scientific progress corrects its mistaken assumptions and omissions in the past. As genomics abilities grow, so too must our conceptual accounts of what genomics can tell us, in some cases informing ongoing discussions about sex, gender, and their intertwined relevance to human health. For example, the so-called sex chromosomes, the X and Y chromosomes, do much more than code for sex characteristics. They're relevant to cancer, age-related genomic changes, human reproduction, various aspects of human physiology, and much more. Using sex and gender accurately in research is important for generating rigorous and reproducible scientific results. Health challenges like heart attacks and cancer may vary according to sex, which means the historically standard model of basing biomedical research around cisgender men is not accurate. But sharpening our understanding of what sex and gender are and how they ought to be considered in biomedical research is only about not only about finding relevant differences, it's also about building fundamental scientific knowledge about who we are. The National Institutes of Health and the National Human Genome Research Institute have a long history of caring about these issues. We have investigated how to measure sex and gender. We fund research related to sexual and gender minorities, and we have a variety of programs aimed to ensuring an inclusive workforce for our LGBT colleagues. But our track record is also not perfect with these issues. That is why the conversations that we are gonna have for the next two days are so important. During this symposium, we will clarify and contextualize, but not resolve, many of the complexities of sex, gender, and genomics. While there has been tremendous amount of research focusing on the science of sex and gender, we are now in a position to bring a new and important genomics perspective to these efforts. We have new research tools that can enable new advances, but as with any ecosystem of scientific innovation, we need new conceptual approaches to meet the expanded technological capabilities. For example, while NHGRI announced the completion of the Human Genome Project now 21 years ago, it really wasn't until very recently that the Telomere to Telomere Consortium, which is an NIH-funded team of researchers, truly generated a complete sequence of the human Y chromosome. This was a major technical accomplishment that used new genome sequencing technologies and new analytical approaches. Now, when we announced this achievement, we used precise language. We noted that the Y chromosome should not be inherently associated with men. While we know genes on the Y chromosome play key roles in sperm production, there are many other genes involved in human sexual development that are located throughout the genome and are very complex giving rise to the array of human sexual characteristics found among male, female, and intersex individuals. And yet, many media outlets immediately reported that we had finally sequenced the male sex chromosome. This is because the Y chromosome has long been misunderstood and oversimplified as the male sex chromosome. Studies on the history of genetics, show us that a lack of scientific knowledge about the Y chromosome has led to misinformed ideology and superstition. Decades of supposition that in the absence of the actual DNA sequence and accurate information about what that sequence encodes argued that the Y chromosome is not only associated with masculinity, but also violence and mental illness. We must counteract these misperceptions and misinformation by confronting them head on. 
In that regard, the goal of this symposium is to refine our understanding of something that may seem obvious, but is actually quite complex. NHGRI was initially synonymous with one project, the Human Genome Project. Back then, it was 1990, this was all before we had websites or text messaging or Google, and we decided to sequence the human genome. But some people thought we shouldn't. There was actually a coordinated letter writing campaign that argued that the Human Genome Project, and I quote, was simply a bad idea. One of the reasons that some letter writers gave was that it was a waste of time to study the vast majority of the human genome, which was filled with so-called junk DNA. Well, we know that that's not the case, and that vast stretches of DNA, once thought to be totally junk, have many important and complex ways of passing crucial biological information along. I tell you that anecdote because similar arguments have been made about sex and gender. That it is these that these characteristics reflect simple, binary, obvious, unchanging, and so forth. But we know that that is not the case. It would be naive and in some ways arrogant of us to assume that we already know everything there is to know about our chromosomes, especially functional genomic elements related to sex and gender. We certainly know that some of these are sex relevant features like hormone levels and secondary sex characteristics. And we know those vary widely among people and also change throughout the lifespan. In fact, just last week, our colleagues at the National Cancer Institute, in fact, identified inherited genomic variants that may predict the loss of one copy of an XX person's 2X chromosomes as they age. These genomic variants may play a role in promoting the development of abnormal blood cells that only have a single copy of the X chromosome. And these cells then multiply abnormally, leading to several health conditions, including cancer. So this really illustrates the incredible complexity of the human body and how much more we need to learn. We must establish scientific precision that accounts for this kind of sex and gender multidimensionality, in addition to energetic curiosity to understand it. Well, NHGRI is well positioned to be curious in this way. The Human Genome Project, which was, by the way, quite successful, of course, also launched the first ever ethical, legal, and social implications research program, known as the ELSI research program. NHGRI's commitment to the study of ethical, legal, and social implications of our scientific work is a model for scientific agencies around the world. That is what we are here to do. We aim to operationalize the fact that science does not exist on its own. It is performed by people, communicated by people, and informed by a very relevant ethical, legal, and social context. This event is actually a very collaborative NIH effort. It was organized in partnership with our colleagues from the NIH Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office and the Office of Research in Women's Health. And during this symposium, you are gonna hear from doctoral level scientists and clinicians, as well as psychologists, sociologists, historians, healthcare researchers, and scholars of science and technology studies. This is part of our institutional commitment to LC research, interdisciplinarity, that allows us to challenge our fundamental assumptions and remain at the forefront of genomics. This also means communicating with the press and the public to avoid misinformation, to create transparency and engender trust, and to communicate effectively about scientifically complex topics. So thank you very much for joining us. I am very high excited to learn more about all of these topics during this symposium over the next two days. And so I will now turn the program over to Liz Dietz, a researcher in NHGRI's History of Genomics program. Liz? Thank you so much for that introduction, Dr. Green, and thank you to our audience for joining us. It's a pleasure to be with you, to be here with you all for this two-day event. It will be archived on the genome.gov website as a research for future conversations about how we can and ought to think about questions related to sex, gender, and genomics. We are incredibly grateful to each of the 19 speakers and moderators who have taken the time to engage in this conversation with us. Together, we will clarify complexity about sex. So we in these conversations, our researchers, students, journalists, voters, teachers, and more, 
We're all people with stakes in these questions. So together, we'll interrogate how sex relates to gender and why that matters for genomics. So what's so complicated about sex? How and why should we think critically about its biology? And according to what measures should we categorize people as male, female, something else, or not at all? Should we use chromosomes, hormones, gonads, genitals, being good at directions or caring towards animals? These are questions about categorization that are highly relevant to scientific research and healthcare delivery. But they are also social and ethical questions. The NIH's mission is to, quote, seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and the application of that knowledge to enhance health. So this symposium focuses on fundamental understanding related to sex and gender. Sex and gender encompass an array of biological and social characteristics that are themselves meaningful in an array of ways. Some of these characteristics matter to how we parse health data, others to the allocation of rights to protected classes. Still others are essential to scientific progress, like developing novel approaches in cancer research. It is as a result necessary to fulfilling the NIH mission that we think carefully about what sex is. As the largest biomedical grant-making organization in the world, it is also our job to provide the research community with tools for thinking about the science that it does. So this isn't only about getting the science right, although, of course, that's a key part of it. But we also must take the importance of our work seriously in its social context. Why does it matter? For whom? Where are there disagreements that might produce better answers? And from that, what are new questions that are worth pursuing? So this event, as Dr. Green noted, is co-sponsored by three NIH components. One of them is us, the National Human Genome Research Institute, NHGRI. So you just heard about that from Dr. Green. So that's where I'm a researcher. My job is in our History of Genomics program, which contains a group of social scientists dedicated to understanding genomics in their social, historical, and ethical context. Our partners in this effort are the Sexual and Gender Minority Research Office and the Office of Research in Women's Health. Each of these partners is deeply committed to rigorous and ethical science in the interest of health. So that's what brings us here today. When we at NIH award a grant to a scientist or a group to perform biological research, we ask them to adhere to standards. So some of these standards are responsive to past injustices. For example, research with human participants needs informed consent because of the known harms that have been caused by research performed on unknowing people. Other standards are about scientific integrity and about transparency, like rules about data sharing. And some are about scientific rigor, such as NIH policy related to sex as a biological variable. So we know that historically, women have been excluded from research, both as researchers and as study subjects. And so they have ultimately also been excluded from the benefits of research. Female study animals have also historically been avoided. It's often cheaper and easier to study, for example, male mice only. So this matters a whole heck of a lot for research. Research should do good, and it also should be good. In other words, NIH-funded research must add to our body of knowledge, and it should do so in rigorous, reproducible, and methodologically valid ways. When we at the NIH, quote, seek to advance health, that needs to be for all people not just a subset of people along racial or gendered lines. So NIH's 2016 policy on sex as a biological variable is a product of these aims. Previous NIH policy in the 1990s tried to address this problem by requiring the inclusion of women as well as racial and ethnic minorities. But it was slow to be adopted, and it only related to phase three trials. So this is quite late in the research process, which means that a whole lot of basic preclinical, and human investigations would have already taken place. So NIH policy on sex as a biological variable intervenes on the preclinical work that makes up 51% of NIH-funded research. The policy articulates the NIH expectation that, quote, sex as a biological variable will be factored into research designs, analyses, and reporting in vertebrate animal and human studies strong justification must be provided for applications proposing to study only one sex. So it's the product of compromise, right? It's equally it's easily communicable, and it simplifies things that are in practice quite complicated, namely how to think about sex and its relationship to gender. 
And also, it intervenes on a real problem. All research doesn't need to identify or search for sex differences, but some is poorly designed if it cannot. This, the assumption that sex does not matter when it might is an error. The assumption that sex does matter when it does not is also an error. Failing to in interrogate and acknowledge assumptions or to recognize that there are assumptions in the first place, also errors. Careful study design can help to mitigate these harms and to make research more rigorous and more reproducible. NIH policy on sex as a biological variable asks research to do just that, to consider sex with care. So that's part of the conversation that we're here to have today. How ought we to think of, its, of sex and its relationship to gender in empirically rigorous ways? We know that how to think about sex and gender in research remains a site of significant trouble for researchers. For example, a recent informal review of a subset of grants that we here at NIH and NHGRI funded found a significant amount of confusion and conflation between the terms sex and gender. So as scientists, we know we need to think about sex categories, in part due to NIH reporting requirements, but not everyone has the right tools for knowing exactly what sex is or how it relates to gender. So we need to help one another understand which term is correct. And we need to help one another understand why they're important in the first place. But at the same time, the conversations that we have today and tomorrow will help to contextualize why efforts to separate sex from gender in research are far more complicated than they might appear. Nothing, however, that we talk about today will be particularly novel. This includes the accounts of sex that these experts offer, how they relate to gender, and our focus on clarifying complexity. These are all parts of ongoing interdisciplinary efforts to be more precise in our empirical descriptions of the world around us. For example, the 2022 National Academies report for NIH on measuring sex and gender already offers the kind of multivariate definitions of sex and gender that we're here to better understand in the context of genomics today. A contemporary account of what sex is, however, doesn't quite answer the question of why thinking carefully about sex matters. That is a matter of ethics, just as it is of science. Not, of course, that we can ever separate from eth ethics from science. So we at NHGRI work within an established LC tradition of considering the ethical, legal, and social implications of research at the forefront of genomics. Sometimes, as Dr. Green noted, this demands that we reconsider our fundamental assumptions not only about what scientific projects are worth doing, but how to understand the fundamental concepts that we're dealing with. For example, NIH policy on sex as a biological variable isn't only about scientific rigor. It responds to the historical exclusion of women in human research, just as it does to the translational problem of, for example, using only one sex type of study animals. The failure to include women in research is an artifact of structural discrimination, even if it is the product of incorrect assumptions about the need to study multiple sexes. It is also the only the tip of the iceberg. Researchers have established that identities and sex characteristics exist in a wide range. Sometimes sex and gender align, sometimes they don't. Sometimes particular sex characteristics matter to a scientific object of study. Sometimes gender identity matters, Sometimes neither are relevant. Good science needs a conceptual toolkit that can sort through which is the case. The solutions to questions of sex and gender in scientific research are therefore only partly about rigor. They are also about responding to harm and addressing injustice. The LC approach turns our attention to the relationship between law and science. Science shapes law just as the law shapes the kind of science that we do. The science of sex is fundamental to how the law no, not only defines, but protects on the basis of sex. In other words, how we understand what the biology of sex is matters both for research and for the ways that scientific understandings frame and authorize the world in which we live. It is both scientifically and ethically urgent to arrive at these definitions with care and to allow our understanding to evolve as our tools for study evolve as well. So we'll begin today with a discussion of the science of sex, with a particular focus on genetics and genomics.
Just sex is an incredibly interesting thing to try to understand, right? At first blush, it seems simple. A neat binary between male and female, ostensibly conserved throughout the animal and plant kingdoms and maybe stable throughout the lifespan. But scientists have long seen evidence that it's not. Variations in sex conditions post, uh, pose exceptions to rules of binary sex. More than exceptions, they challenge whether the rules were right in the first place. So whether we chose to regard whether we choose to regard such variations as exceptions to established rules or challenges that re, that demand we rethink our frameworks is a matter of ethical responsibility, just as it is of science. So this too, not novel. The 2022 National Academies report, for example, which offers sex as quote multidimensional, models the latter framework. In defining sex as multidimensional, it makes clear that just as gender describes a spectrum of identities, so too does sex, across a number of characteristics that could be, but aren't necessarily of relevance to a given study. Our first speakers, Julia Serrano, Catherine Clune taylor Melissa Wilson, Sham Sam Sharp, and Tucker Pyle, will help us to understand what genetics and genomics can and cannot tell us about sex. One important understanding that these conversations rest on is a sense that science is a process. It's not merely a set of conclusions. In other words, thinking about the science of sex demands that we think about the decisions, the assumptions, the methods, and the goals that produce scientific work. This afternoon, panelists will offer historical context for how and why we think about the biology of sex the way we do. They will illuminate how this thinking relates to gender and why such contextualization matters so much. The way that we categorize sex seems obvious and inevitable, perhaps, but it's actually the product of decisions at the nexus of science, politics, and bureaucracy. Beans Velosi and Paisley Cura will walk us through how sex came to be treated as a discrete binary variable, one that's separate from gender. They'll help us to contextualize the ways in which sex is made to matter, like in scientific research, medicine, legal identification, and more. These are places that demand we rethink such rigid divisions between male and female as well as sex and gender. Then Ross Brooks, Christopher Donahue, and Os Keys will push our discussion of the stakes of genomic explanations further by situating chromosome research within its legacy of eugenic reasoning and the contemporary interplay between basic science research and the policy it informs. Tomorrow, we'll ask, how and for whom can we do better? First, we'll approach this question with the guidance of Anne Fausto Sterling, Patrick Grzanka, and Kellen Baker. They'll push us to think critically about how we operationalize sex and gender in research and policy making, with particular attention to the potential for harm to sexual and gender minorities. Then we'll round out the event with a conversation between Shay Kill McLean, Nikki Stevens, and Isabel Goldman, who bring a variety of disciplinary perspectives to bear on technical questions. How do we build just systems for sex data and stor storage and collection? How do we operationalize useful and precise accounts of sex in research and science communication? What can journals do to ensure rigorous, accurate reporting of sex data? And finally, how can we operationalize the fundamental insight that good science is fundamentally the same thing, it's not separable from, equitable, ethical, and just science? Ultimately, we hope that these conversations offer all of you in the audience, scientists, physicians, journalists, parents, students, and so many more, some new tools for doing well and for doing good. Thank you so much. Hello, I'm Tina Hessman Say. I'm a senior writer at Science News Magazine, and it's my pleasure to be moderating this morning's sessions. Um, the first uh, set of speakers that we are gonna hear from are Julia Serrano, and Catherine Clune Taylor. Uh, and then we will have a, a question and answer session after those two speakers present their talks. Then we'll go into a break and then we'll have more speakers after the break. Uh, our first speaker this morning is Julia Serrano who's going to be talking to us about the biology of biological sex. Julia is a 
biologist, independent scholar, and the author of five books, including Whipping Girl, a transsexual woman on sexism and the scapegoating of femininity, and Sexed Up, how society sexualizes us and how we can fight back. Her writings on gender, sexuality, science, and social justice have also appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, Time, Salon, The Daily Beast, and Ms. Julia has a PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics from Columbia University and spent 17 years as a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley in the field of genetics, evolution, and developmental biology. Julia's life experiences as a trans woman and her understanding of biology gives her a unique perspective on these matters and her writings have been used as teaching materials in colleges across North America. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Serrano. Hello, thank you, Tina. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm going to share my screen now. So yes, it's an honor to be here. Um, as Eric and Liz have already discussed, there's many different facets to this conversation we're gonna have over the next two days. Um, but I was asked, um, to introduce the biology behind biological sex for this talk. And I've put biological sex in quotes here because sometimes people invoke it to imply that it's a simple singular entity. However, as with all scientific fields, um, the more that we investigate it, the more complicated it turns out to be. And this is certainly true for biology um, with regards to sex. So um, before I get into uh, kind of how we should be thinking about biology and sex now, I think it's important to start by talking about misconceptions that have shaped and distorted um, our ideas about um, this subject matter in the past and sometimes present. So I'm going to talk about four different misconceptions here. The first one is essentialism, which is the belief that all members of a particular category, especially categories that are considered to be natural in origin, um, that they share a particular set of qualities or an essence with one another. Um, so this is a very prevalent uh, psychological phenomenon, especially in young children. And but an example of this might be the way we think of dogs as having a kind of essence, a dogness per se, that makes them all the same and that makes all other animals, such as cats, different because they lack this imagined dogness. Now, of course, we know that dogs vary greatly in their, there's a lot of genetic variation and phenotypic variation. And uh, we also know that dogs have a common ancestor with wolves and even cats and humans if you go far enough back evolutionarily. So while this is a very uh, pervasive view, it's biologically incorrect. And we often find discussions of sex, people will have sex essentialism where they'll assume that men must have a male essence and women must have a female essence. But again, this is bio biologically incorrect as we will see over the course of this talk. Um, a second misconception is sex determinism. So this is the belief that sex is a closed system, so it's not affected by environment or randomness, that once it's set into motion, produces two totalizing binary outcomes. So many of us in our biology classes in high school or college may have come across a, a, a common determinist model for sex development in humans that usually goes something like this, that due to the presence or absence of the Y chromosome or the SRY gene, which is on the Y chromosome, that that leads the gonads to develop into either testes or ovaries. And then those gonads will produce either androgens or estrogens, and that those will masculinize or feminize the body and the brain. And so there's some truth to some aspects of that model, but that model ignores the vast amount of biological complexity and potential diversity, um, as I will be showing over the course of this talk. A third misconception is the sex-gender distinction. Um, and so this is a belief that sex refers to the body, which is viewed as biological, but wholly distinct from gender, which is imagined to be the mind, such as our identities and behaviors. And that's presumed to be purely the product of socialization, 
So while the sex-gender distinction was very popular with 20th century psychologists, um, it doesn't hold true, and that will be explained over this talk too. And then finally, while the three previously mentioned uh, perspectives on sex all explain why there are stereotypically masculine men and feminine women, they don't at all account for the fact that there's a lot of gendered sexual diversity, including but not limited to people who fall under the LGBTQIA plus um, spectrum. And uh, so what because of that, a lot of times people are coming from these perspectives have historically pathologized gender and sexual minorities, imagining that something must have gone wrong in the natural order of things. And perhaps the most common of these pathologizing explanations is historically been called sexual inversion, which is basically the idea that gender and sexual minorities are either like men with feminized brains or women with masculinized brains. And I will explain, it'll become clear over the course of this talk why those presumptions are misplaced. So if these are all misconceptions, then how should we be thinking about biology and sex? So I'm going to give you my rendition. It's definitely uh, informed by my training, which was in genetics and developmental biology. Um, people coming from other subfields would probably give a somewhat different talk, but we might agree on, on the general gist of it. Um, but where I would start is that Sex is way more than XX versus XY chromosomes. The human genome has somewhere in the ballpark of 25,000 different genes, which encode proteins that all interact with one another um, and can influence sex in all sorts of complex ways. And so while each of us may have some shared biology, each of us is also um, has a lot of biological variation. Similarly, while we may share certain aspects of our socializations, all of us also have very individualized um, experiences. So all these different factors come together in an unfathomably complex way to create the sex and gender diversity that's all around us. Um, or another way of putting it is that sex is multifaceted, variable, and sometimes malleable, um, which I will explain over the next few slides. So sex, rather than being one thing, it's best thought of as a collection of sexually dimorphic traits. Dimorphic meaning that they tend to arise in two different clusters. So there are the so-called primary sex characteristics, which are called that because um, they're present from birth. And this includes uh, sex chromosomes. It includes reproductive organs, such as gonads or genitals and so on. Then there's the ratio of sex hormones that we have. So all of us have both androgens and estrogens, um, albeit in somewhat different uh, levels. And then in response to sex hormones, um, there are the secondary sex characteristics. Um, these typically arise at puberty. Um, and these would be things such as facial hair in men, breast development in women, differences in height, muscle fat distribution, and so forth. So while all of these are sexually dimorphic traits, they all happen to be variable in the population. So for instance, with regards to each of these different traits, some people might fall in between or outside of what's considered standard for male or female in our society. And this is the case for um, many intersex people. In addition to this, all these different traits might not all align in the same direction within the same person. Um, in other words, some people have a mix of female and male sex characteristics. And so this is true for some intersex people as well as some trans people. And this may all seem very counterintuitive if you're coming from an essentialist or a determinist perspective, but it all makes perfect sense if you understand that almost all human traits are complex traits. And what that means is that they arise at the intersection or the interactions of many, many different factors. Some of them might be biological, but there might be some environmental influences. And with any biological system, there's always a certain amount of randomness or noise to the system. Um, and so basically to highlight kind of how to think about complex traits, I'm going to go through the next few slides, a couple examples of this. Um, so what this is, and you know, there's not going to be a test on this. You don't have to 
to pay attention to everything in the slide. But basically what this is, is this is the biochemical pathway for sex um, hormone synthesis with testosterone, which is a common androgen, and estradiol, which is a common estrogen, highlighted in, in red. And then in blue, these are different proteins that our bodies make that convert these different steroid um, chemicals from one to the other. Now you can see when you think about this whole thing, you can imagine how small differences in the amount or the function of any one of these proteins could just shift the system a little bit, right? But it doesn't stop there because once you have something like estradiol, it can bind to one of several different estrogen receptors. Um, and then once estrogen is bound to the receptor, it can interact with all sorts of different proteins um, within the cell um, in different ways, um, often to regulate gene expression, so to turn genes on or off. Um, so once again, one can imagine how small differences in the amount or function of any of these proteins could shift the system in one direction or another. Furthermore, each different type of cell will have a different complement of proteins in it. Um, which helps explain why your skin cells will react to estrogen in a different way than, say, a muscle cell or reproductive tissues or the immune system and so forth. Okay, and so one more example of this, I mentioned kind of the determinist, sex determinist idea of, you know, a Y chromosome or the SRY gene determines your, your, that you're male and that's all there is to it. And as you can see from this diagram, that there are many other genes and proteins involved in this, each of them also being another site of potential um, diversity um, that can arise. Um, and I also want to show this um, image because it also highlights the fact that during embryonic development, um, we all start out uh, with the capacity to develop female or male anatomies, um, depending on which signals that we um, experience at that time. And so this is just another idea that counters the idea that there are fixed, like predetermined sexes or sex essences. So once you understand how complex all that is, um, it becomes clear that complex traits do not act like on or off light switches where traits are either turned on or off, but rather they tend to give rise to bell curve shaped spectrums in which most people are clustered around some kind of average outcome, but there are always going to be outliers from the norm. And the way that this tends to play out with sexually dimorphic traits is you get overlapping bell curves. So um, the bell curves on the top might represent, for instance, primary sex characteristics where um, the curves are largely separated, but there is a little bit of overlapping tails um, between you know, the sexes. And then there are other things such as um, differences in height, which like the bell curves on the bottom, where there's actually a lot of overlap between the sexes. Okay, so not only is sex multifaceted and variable, but sometimes it's also malleable. And this is especially true for sex characteristics that arise in response to hormones. So once again, all of us have estrogen receptors and androgen receptors, um, and we can react, or, or our bodies can react to both of those, not only with regards to um, developing uh, secondary sex characteristics, but anyone who's ever been on any kind of HRT, um, hormone replacement therapy, knows that it can affect other aspects of yourself whether it be your mood or your metabolism, your libido, and so forth. Um, so there are a lot of less obvious uh, impacts that these can have on us. Um, on this following slide, um, these are two different studies looking at trans people who've undergone uh, gender-affirming hormone therapy um, and looking at changes that take place in the process of that. The paper on the left is about um, sex-specific DNA methylation patterns, which are known to regulate gene expression, um, that these change in trans people who hormonally transition. Um, and the paper on the right shows that hormonally transitioning can also elicit certain changes in the brain. So while there are some aspects to sex that are not malleable, others are, and so we should take that into consideration uh, when considering this uh, subject. Okay, so the paper on the right also allows me a jumping off point to talk about another issue that has long been viewed as controversial, which is whether or not our brains are sexed. 
and I put brain sex in quotes here for the same reason I put biological sex in quotes. Um, and basically, uh, in the past, people coming from an essentialist or determinist point of view have assumed that there must be completely different male versus female brains. Whereas people coming from a sex gender distinction have long believed that uh, the exact opposite, that there can't possibly be any innate sex differences, um, rather they're all learned or socialized. And so these two sides have long been in a protracted nature versus nurture battle against one another. Um, but it's safe to say that in contemporary biology has largely moved past these nature versus nurture ideas because you know our bodies and our brains are biological and our brains are also shaped by the world that we live in and what we learn and what we, and so forth. So the way that I would describe it is as I've been saying all along that we should think about brain sex as multifaceted, variable, and sometimes malleable. And so uh, the paper shown here is a really good review going through the research that I will not go through all the points listed here, but suffice it to say that there's a lot of research showing that rather than there being male or female brains, or rather than our brains being completely unsexed, that sex influences our brains in a lot of different ways through different mechanisms, sometimes genetic, sometimes hormonal, sometimes environmental, or some combination thereof. And that for every sex-specific brain characteristic that's been found, there's also a lot of variability in it, okay? So um, with regards to human beings, if we're thinking about like so-called brain sex, there have been three different characteristics that uh, people who study gender and sexuality have long known about and talked about. Um, and these would be gender identity, which refers to whether you understand yourself as a woman, man, or other. There's gender expression, which is whether your behaviors and interests tend to be masculine and or feminine. And then there's sexual orientation, which is, you know, the sex or genders um, of the people you're attracted to. Okay, so just like all these previously mentioned sex characteristics, these three traits um, are all variable and can all differ from one another within the same individual. So for instance, you know, people who are trans, that is, who have a gender identity that doesn't match the sex they're assigned at birth, um, trans people vary in our sexual orientations and our gender expressions. Similarly, if you're gay, you may vary in your um, gender expressions and gender identities as well, and so forth. Um, just checking on time. Uh, so each of these three different characteristics, um, in addition to varying um, within given individuals, um, there's significant evidence that they're influenced by biology rather than being strictly social. Um, briefly, some of this includes the fact that they tend to be impervious to social interventions, um, that is conversion therapy and, and things like that. They also tend to exist across cultures and throughout history. You can see people, who, gender and sexual minorities who vary in these ways. Furthermore, um, there have been uh, numerous cases where um, genetic males um, who either lost or were born without a penis, um, where due to psychologists' beliefs about the sex gender distinction at the time, at the time were raised as girls. And what was found is that most of those children tended to be masculine in their gender expression as children. Um, attracted to girls and women as they got older, and many of them spontaneously identified as male, as boys rather than girls. And a lot of their experiences uh, mirror what a lot of trans and intersex people experience of strongly identifying as a sex other than the one they were assigned at birth, um, in contradiction to our socializations um, and the apparent sex of our bodies. So the most parsimonious way to, to understand all this, um, all of these different forms of evidence, is to recognize that, as with all the sex characteristics listed before, that something like gender identity um, involves overlapping bell curves, where you can imagine most cisgender people um, are clustered towards the center of the curves, and perhaps trans people um, exist at the um, overlapping tails of these curves. 
and one might expect gender expression and sexual orientation to um, act in a similar way. Now, I, I want to make clear here that I'm making a very different argument than that which I've seen um, in a lot of discussions about trans people or gender and sexual minorities. You often see unidimensional spectrums, like this is an idea of, well, it's more than just a binary, it's a spectrum. And you'll see a picture like this, where like there's women at one pole, men at the other pole, and trans people and other gender and sexual minorities are in like a, a nebulous netherworld in between those two states of beings. And this is not what I'm saying. <laughs> um, Basically, the point that I'm making is probably better described um, via the term multivariate distributions. Um, as I'm showing on the next slide, this is a graph that I took from the Wikipedia site on multivariate normal distributions, where it shows two bell curves and how you would expect the distributions to be. I labeled one gender expression and one gender identity um, to just give you an idea of kind of how varied, the, there are many different outcomes that can happen between two different bell curves like that. And then if you imagine sexual orientation as a, oops, there it goes, sexual orientation as a third axis, um, vertically, then you can imagine that there's even more gender and sexual diversity involved here. And my purpose in showing you is not to like say that we've mapped out all of the genders and sexualities onto some kind of three-dimensional grid. Um, I don't believe that that's possible to do. But I think it gives you an idea of how much diversity there is. And also importantly, you can see from thinking about this that there's not going to be like a discrete line that separates straight people from all the gender and sexual minorities, right? We differ by degree rather than by kind, which is exactly what you would expect um, due to natural variation. Okay, so just a couple more points. Um, so another thing that comes up with, you know, is in the past, especially people coming from a determinist perspective throughout the 20th century, we're looking for the cause of why people turn out to be gay or turn out to be trans. Um, and there is a long time when I was first going to grad school, there are all these conversations about looking for the gay gene as if there's going to be like a magical gene that gets flipped and then people turn out to be gay rather than straight, right? Um, so the thing is, once we understand that these are all complex traits, then it becomes clear why no one has ever found any singular cause for what makes um, people vary in their gender expressions, sexual orientations, and gender identities. And that's because complex traits not only give rise to a spectrum of outcomes, but they also have many, many different inputs, right? There are a lot of different genes and proteins that may be involved, and they may interact with all sorts of epigenetic or hormonal or neurobiological or environmental or experiential um, different factors. Um, and once again, in addition to um, environmental influences, there's going to be some randomness and noise um, to this biological system. And basically the end result means that two people can end up at the same outcome, such as being gay or trans, but for completely different reasons. In much the same way that Two people could be the same height. They could be five foot four or six foot two, but nobody believes that they got to be that height due to the exact same reasons, right? And so there's a biological, um, this biological phenomenon is often called degeneracy. And I will point out that this use of the word degeneracy is very different from the way it is used in other settings to refer to deterioration or deviancy. Um, that's not what this is supposed to, to mean. Degeneracy in this biological context means that there are many different factors or pathways in which you can wind up at the same outcome or end result. And so to emphasize this further, um, and especially since we're going to be talking about the genome today, um, What's shown here are two different papers, uh, studies that are done. They're called genome-wide association studies, where you basically look throughout the whole genome uh, for genes that um, play a role in some trait or outcome. And so the paper on the left is looking for differences uh, or genes that contribute to differences in height. And the paper on the right is a similar study looking for um, basically genes that might be involved in same-sex sexual behavior. And both studies basically found the same thing. First, they found that there were many, many genes that 
each of which plays a very, very tiny, small contribution to the overall outcome, right? And then in addition to that, all the genes that were found, like only made up in the, the case of height, 10% of the variation um, could be attributed to the genes they found in the same sex sexual behavior paper. Um, all the genes they found total only contributed to about eight to 25% of the variation which means that other factors such as environment and randomness can basically are, are also likely to be involved in these um, specific traits. Or to put this a different way, um, basically you could be privy to a person's entire genome, but from that you could not know exactly how tall they're going to be, nor could you actually know what their sexual orientation is going to be. And the same would likely be true for all the other sex characteristics um, that I talked about earlier. So basically, um, I'm kind of coming to the end of uh, the talk that I've prepared. Um, but I wanted to leave you with, I have um, on the webpage below, um, it's called uh, Biology, Sex, and Transgender People Resource Page. So you can either click that link or um, you can Google that. Um, and basically what that is, is it's a compilation of all of my writings on the subject, um, because there are a lot of different uh, subtopics to this that I um, haven't had time to address here. Um, one that I definitely want to point your way is I have a recent essay that you can find there um, on uh, gamete-centric definitions of sex, which have become very popular um, with people, especially anti-trans campaigners, um, who want to deny that there's any gender or sexual diversity. Um, they've embraced these. Um, and so I kind of dissect uh, those definitions there. And also in a lot of my other writings, um, especially in my book, Sexed Up, I talk about how we perceive sex and how we categorize people um, according to sex, often based on very, very few visual cues. Um, and so I explore why it is that we do that, why it is in such a binary fashion, and also why we tend to view the sexes as opposites, despite all the diversity and overlap that exists between the sexes. Um, so I will stop there, and I look forward to hearing your questions after we get to hear Catherine's talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Serrano. That was a fascinating talk. Um, and I would like to remind people, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat, and uh, we will we'll try to get to as many of those as we can during the question and answer period. Um, we're, we're doing pretty good on time, so we may have uh, more time than we thought for the question and answer at the end, which is, which is always good. This is a stimulating discussion topic. Uh, so next, we're going to hear from Catherine Clune Taylor, uh, who will be talking about sex and gender complexity in scientific research, ethical, political, and, and epistemological. I'm sorry, <laughs> can't wrap my tongue around that word. <laughs> um, uh, Dr. Clune Taylor is an assistant professor in the program in gender and sexuality studies at Princeton University. She's known for her in-depth critical feminist analysis of the science of sex, gender, and sexual difference, drawing on her training as a feminist theorist, philosopher of science, and in the biosciences. She writes extensively on the medical management of intersex conditions in children. She's published articles in Hapachia, Bioethics, and the American Journal of Public Health, and is the author of the chapter is Sex Socially Constructed in the Rutledge Handbook on Feminist Philosophy of Science, published in 2020. Her book, Securing Autonomously Gendered Futures, A Feminist Philosophical Defense of Intersex and Trans Kids, is currently under review. So I will turn it over to you, Dr. Clune Taylor. Great. Thank you so much. I am so thrilled to be here um, and to be in conversation with Julia and Tina today. Uh, and I'm so excited for the whole slate of presenters. I think this is a very exciting conference to be uh, be held uh, by the NIH um, 
uh, right now at this present moment. So I'm going to go ahead and my, share my slides and we will jump right in. So um, a copy of these slides for those who might be interested are currently available at my website. If you go to clune-taylor.com slash upcoming dash presentations or hyphen presentations, there's just a link there in case you want to download them, particularly um, for the bibliography at the end. So my plan today actually is just to kind of break things down into three parts. I'm going to jump in and talk a bit, a bit about what I mean by saying that science is ethical, political, and epistemological. And epistemology is a, a big word for saying related to knowledge production. Um, and then we're going to jump into talking about sex and gender complexity in scientific research. And I'm going to use a, a case study there that I think is familiar to all of us. Um, regarding the exclusion of women from research on heart attacks or cardiac arrest. And then I'm going to move in uh, to talk specifically about intersex conditions and the inclusion or exclusion of intersex folks from uh, clinical research, uh, as well as the ways they, they are researched and the kind of uh, particular sorts of political and ethical issues that that, that might point towards. So first, Let's hop in and talk about science and ethics. And I'll start here with thinking about research ethics, as I imagine for a lot of the folks who are currently um, joining us, when they hear about ethics in the context of their own work or related to science, the first thing they think about is related to research ethics. I expect a lot of you have had uh, experience putting together IRB applications or other kind of clinical, um, clinical research applications where you know you're going to have to talk about certain things, right? So issues related to, um, or the primary issues that might come up when we start thinking about research ethics or thinking about subject autonomy, um, issues around informed consent, knowing that people can remove themselves from trials. Uh, we also talk about study benefits versus risks, right? And one of the things that I think most folks here will be familiar with is talking about like, we often have to distinguish between the potential benefits for the community of people, the future community of people with these conditions versus the potential benefits for the people in the study itself, right? That sometimes it's the case that we're not really sure that folks in the studies are gonna benefit directly, but we might be just thinking about down the road. And that might change the way that we kind of do our risk benefit analysis. You might come up with issues about clinical equipoise, which is when we're in those situations where um, researchers are really not clear about whether you know option A or option B might be better or worse. And often in those cases, it raises questions about like what should our control arm in our research study be? Um, and then there are issues around subject diversity, right? And this will bring me to my, my uh, example here about heart attacks in women, right? We know now that it's important to have subjects in clinical research that are representative of the population. Otherwise, we have limited research, right? Our research is um, uh, introduces error. It's less accurate. It's less uh, representative. But even if we pull back from this, right, pulling back from thinking about research ethics in particular, we can start talking about science and values or science and ethics in other ways, right? So if we think about this issue of subject diversity, one of the reasons why we think that it might be a problem that women were not included in research on heart attacks is that it's an issue of justice, right? It means that one group of people is uh, not benefiting from the scientific research that we're doing, um, that they're having worse outcomes, uh, and so, you know, we can see that as an issue of justice, but we can also talk about bioethics, right? And bioethics itself or the principles of bioethics are introduced after um, we have kind of research ethics or contemporary understandings of research ethics that really emerge out of Nuremberg and, and post-World War II. But we start thinking about bioethics in the clinic, and that's also something that can map fairly easily in certain ways onto research ethics, right? So thinking about autonomy, beneficence, and non-malfeasance, right? So doing good and not doing harm, uh, and also issues of justice here, right? So treating sim justice, how it's it kind of uh, articulated in the co context of bioethical principles can be done in a variety of different ways. But one way is with regards to treating relevantly similar cases similarly, right? So 
if two people come in, even if they are of different races, but they both have strep throat, we think that they should be treated the same way, right? Because race there, the racial difference is not a relevant difference. However, if we have those two cases, but one of those people is uh, um, allergic to a certain antibiotic, then we would treat them differently, right? That is a relevant difference there. Further, we might think of biomedical science itself as a good, right? That often we generally agree that the aims of biomedical sciences or are, are, are biomedical science or various areas of biomedical research are goods in themselves, right? So improving the mortality and morbidity of diabetics is a good. That's why it's important that we do high quality research on diabetes, um, that there are those who are working towards cure, cures, but even just increasing or, or improving the, the uh, morbidity, the, the kind of management of diabetes is a good. And thus there is an ethical imperative here to do biomedical research well, right? We grant that, med that scientific research can be done in better and worse ways. And so there is a, a, a kind of ethical imperative that comes out of just taking science as a good or biomedical science and the aims as a good that translates here to how we should do it as well. Now, thinking about science as political, there are a lot of different ways that folks have and can articulate science as political. Um, even in uh, Dr. Green's opening remarks today, he mentioned that there can be a lot of social and political influences on science, right? And on the, the topics that we take up, uh, our research interests, the kind of biases that we might bring to the table in undertaking that research. But for today, I barely want to kind of grant that science is political insofar as it shapes policy, right? That often it's the case that research that's being done, that's funded by the NIH, is hopefully being done towards an end. We want it to be applicable in some way, right? Now, importantly, the relationship between science and policy is complex and often political in the more popular sense of the term, right? So we might think of some examples here. I will say as someone who is um, has formal training in microbiology, I am someone who personally has some feelings about how we responded to the COVID-19 pandemic as well as the current COVID-19 vaccination program. I am one of those people who, for example, has some very strong feelings about the various variants that might be being chosen or, or uh, that different pharmaceutical companies are being um, required to uh, produce here, right? Um, and we grant that what we saw, for example, in the pandemic response was shaped by, by science, but also shaped by a lot of other political imperatives as well, right? We can also point here to the issue of the recent Chevron ruling, right? One of our concerns or one of many folks' concerns about the Chevron ruling, which is the ruling that means that um, there's judicial authority, for example, over um, uh, national kind of organizations like the EPA, for example, or the FDA, uh, these point to issues here about epistemic authority, right? That not only is science political, but we actually think, for example, that, you know, judiciary should maybe not be the authorities here because they lack the epistemic authority. We think that certain folks have particular experience and that it's important for us to be uh, using and relying on and turning towards these people and having those inform our policies for better or worse. And so finally, thinking about science and epistemology, I'm going to start by just like with a basic definition of science as the most efficient method for producing reliable knowledge about the natural and unnatural world around us. And it looks different. Scientific methods look different in different fields. But the important here is that thing here is that we grant that it can be done in better and worse ways. And we see that in simply insofar as we distinguish between different qualities of evidence, right? Often in clinical research, we talk about the kind of gold standard of the double blind clinical trial. And we, whereas we might think about like um, expert, uh, expert knowledge and like clinical experience as like the lowest form of kind of evidence that we want to base things on. Um, and 
I wanted to note that thinking about and approaching this, actually, some a, a variety of different uh, philosophers of science have attempted to come up with various epistemic values to guide our, our science. Uh, practices in order to think about, you know, how can we do it better and more, better in better ways, right? Like what makes one theory or one account better or worse? And I wanted to give just like a few examples of these. Um, and some of these things might be, you know, uh, familiar to folks, but I think one of the major ones will be repli replicability. There's the word that I can't say, um, is that we want studies that, uh, are, for example, predictively competent. That means simply means that it makes predictions so that we can test the theory, right? If I have a theory that doesn't make any predictions and then I can't test it, it's not very helpful to me. Um, but we also want it to be replicated in different contexts by different people, right? We want it to be consistent with other areas of science, right? It's not great if I have a theory in molecular biology that then conflicts with folks in immunology and what they're thinking. And sometimes it might mean that the folks in immunology are wrong, but if we're going to kind of forward a theory that is going to really stand against or be inconsistent with other fields, that might be a moment where we want to kind of step back, right? And we, for example, really like theories that have a lot of explanatory power that do a good job at explaining the phenomena that we see in the world around them. And so the reasons why excluding women from studies on heart disease is a problem then are ethical, political, and epistemological, right? Now it's ethical in so far as that's unjust, right? It compromises um, our, our ethical imperatives regarding like producing high quality research are compromised. Um, but it also uh, simply is unjust because it means that one group of people is not getting as good care, right? They're having worse outcomes. It's also political insofar as it results in worse policies, right? If we have a very specific understanding of uh, what heart attack looks like and we're generalizing it for all patients, it means that physicians are getting worse training, right? They're being trained to only look for a specific set of symptoms and not any others means that heart attack in women is being overlooked or underdiagnosed. And it's also epistemological insofar as we're getting worse science, right? It's less accurate, it's less representative, it's less generalizable, and it introduces error. And um, I wanted to point here specifically to Heather Douglas's work. Heather Douglas is a philosopher of science, has a book called Science Policy and the Value-Free Ideal, uh, which I think is a phenomenal book. I want all scientists to read it. It's about the history of the emergence of the um, value-free ideal for science, particularly after uh, World War II. And she has a specific chapter here specifically on the moral responsibilities of scientists with regards to error in their research. And so we can say here, okay, here are all these reasons why, and I often actually think about science as like a little triangle that's ethical, political, and epistemological. Like it's uh, what we're doing here is always all three of those things necessarily. And coming back to our uh, kind of sample case here about heart attack, however, what do we mean when we say women? Right? We might say, okay, yes, uh, it, it is a problem that women were excluded from heart attack. We see that there do seem to be different, um, different presentations of symptoms in women. But even then, that's still a very like general distinction I've made between men and women. I haven't told you anything about how I'm defining those people, right? Am I talking about, when I say women, am I saying people with XX chromosomes? Um, I saying people with uteruses, right? I think Julia has done such a beautiful job of hashing out the complexity of biological sex or different kind of biological sex traits. And if we're not actually specific and accurate with what we mean when we're invoking sex and gender, further research will not actually resolve these ethical and political and epistemological concerns. It really just kind of moves them around, right? Or shifts how they look but it doesn't resolve them, not completely. And so let's go on to talk specifically about kind of, again, gender and sex complexity. And so 
sex and gender are complex. <laughs> I've been mostly talking about biological sex. Uh, I really appreciate it, Julia. I think you set me up so beautifully, but kind of the sex and gender distinction, but also noting it's really hard, can be very hard to distinguish between them. And so not only are they both complex, this means that accounting for them in scientific, scientific research is, is a complex thing to do. It means that actually being specific and accurate does raise the epistemic demands upon us, but in ways that ultimately produces more just, more ethical, and more accurate science, right? So here's a way of breaking down sex or uh, biological sex characteristics. We can talk about internal genitalia, uh, internal reproductive structures, gonads, chromosomes, hormones. I also included in brackets here with a question mark, brain structures pointing to, as Julia did earlier, uh, brain organization theory, which um, I include here kind of due to its popularity. I will say that it is the theory of gender development that is underwriting the current treatment models for intersex conditions in children. However, it, well, and I would say, I think it's like very popular in the media right now, but um, while popular, the theory itself relies on a set of deeply problematic assumptions. And we're happy to, I'm happy to discuss this more in the Q and A. I know, I think Julia is similarly not a fan and could also spend some time critiquing brain organization with me, theory with me. But it's worth noting that it relies on a very kind of problematic similarity between genital and neurological t tissues or analogy between the two. And it assumes, it's very strange to me the way it assumes the, uh, the kind of fixedness of whatever effects uh, androgen exposure in particular might have on the brain in utero given the general underdevelopment of the brain at birth, right? It is your least developed organ uh, when you're, when infants are born. And also the kind of evidence of the atypicality of neuroplasticity, right? It just seems like a very kind of strange theory, but I include it because it is quite popular, um, even if problematic. So then it comes to this issue, right, of what I was saying that like sex and gender are complex and it can be very hard to distinguish them. And so, for example, we might consider Ann Festo Sterling's work, who I know is on the program for tomorrow. I'm very excited. Uh, Ann Festo Sterling's work on osteoporosis in her 2005 article, The Bare Bones of Sex, where she points out that we often think about and osteoporosis has really been kind of constructed as a sex linked uh, trait, right? That that it is something that is generally experienced by women. Um, however, Professor Sterling notes that osteoporosis really rather tracks racialized norms of gender. So for example, you do see high rates of osteoporosis in North America among white women. But if we look at, for example, as racialized women who work primarily in physical labor, they do not have high rates of osteoporosis. However, another group who does have high rates of osteoporosis in North America are uh, orthodox, urban ultra-Orthodox Jewish adolescents. And it's because they tend not to uh, engage in much physical activity. They have much less exposure to sunlight they, and they drink less milk than their secular counterparts. Um, and so it really tracks rather the, these kind of patterns that we might see, gendered patterns, that we might see in uh, osteoporosis development really actually tra track racialized norms of gender rather than being something that is tied specifically to sex, right? Another example of this that we might turn to is epigenetic research on black maternal mortality and morbidity in the United States. I think most people are aware that uh, the in the US there are very, very high rates of black maternal mortality and morbidity often three to four times higher than their white counterparts in this country. And it's also clear that a lot of kind of interventions here don't work in the way that we might want. And so here, what we see is racialized and gendered environment or cultural experiences. Many have argued that it's in fact the result of epigenetic changes that are the result of experiences of racism and racialized stress. Uh, and so what we see here is kind of the racialized and gendered environment leaving to identifiable genomic changes. But 
even then note, I don't say that their sex linked changes, right? Because these epigenetic changes are happening in kind of non-sex trait areas of the genes or the genome, right? It's not doing something to, like, for example, on the, on the X chromosome. Um, but it's an outcome, this particular outcome is one we see only in those with uteruses, right? Or those who are capable of getting pregnant. And that's even thinking about it as maternal mortality and morbidity might be a problem. And so far as there are a lot of people who don't identify as women who are black and who have uteruses. And so I've actually never seen any work that distinguishes um, between kind of trans, trans mask men, for example, who might be getting pregnant. Um, further, this assumes, I think even this research, right, assumes that intersex people are also included, which frequently they are out of course, but often um, intersex folks are excluded from all studies on reproduction because it's assumed that they're sterile, even though that's not true. And in fact, uh, it's likely the case that the majority of sterility that are experienced by intersex folks are uh, is um, medically induced, right? It's due to their sterilization as part of their sex assignment, as opposed to them like naturally, quote unquote, being sterile. So now that I've kind of laid a bit of that out, let's go on and talk about intersex uh, in a little bit more detail here. And so I wanna think here about intersex exclusion and inclusion in research. So biomedical research in general excludes intersex subjects for being categorically complex, right? So they, their sex is complicated. And so we think that it, it complicates our study, it complicates our data. Uh, and second, the assumption that they are rare, right? That it's a kind of special area or special kind of case. Now, it's worth noting that while intersex people are generally excluded, I'd like to point out that in a lot of research that does distinguish between sexes, However, they often don't define, like, what is, what is your definition of sex here? Is it XX versus XY chromosomes? Or is it just like having an SRY gene is enough? Because then some folks will count, right? That might not otherwise. We know the SRY gene moves. Um, so a lot, so which is to say, so a lot of research does not actually stipulate exactly what they mean by biological sex in this way. They'll just say like men and women. Maybe you mean people with uteruses, maybe you don't. Maybe you mean people with a particular ratio of hormones, maybe you don't. Further, even when it is stipulated, sex is actually rarely checked in the population. And so we're getting in all our subjects, we're sorting them into male or female, say we're doing it along XX and XY chromosomes, are we actually checking those folks' as chromosomes? Because again, and this kind of brings me to my second point, intersex traits are actually a lot less rare than we think, right? So, um, and, and I think we should, we can talk about and think about why it is we are kind of so, why is there this persistence of this narrative of the rarity of intersex conditions? But I wanted to point to a recent study. So this was in 2017. Um, this was a, a genetic or um, a genetic study uh, of random groups of uh, Ashkenazi Jewish population group and of individuals who identified as white with no particular ethnicity. And it was um, a genetic study that was looking to update the frequency rate of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is the most common intersex condition in the world. And they actually found that the carrier rate for this autosomal re recessive condition, the carrier rate in the Ashkenazi Jewish population was one in seven. And in the white uh, or the Caucasian with no other ethnicity identified group was one in 11. And that was such a high rate of carriership that the authors of the study had to grant that it's likely the case that there is some sort of advantage, a not yet understood advantage to these conditions, which is simply to say 
we might really need to step back from this understanding that intersex conditions might be rare, right? It is likely the case that the majority of those people with inter the majority of those with intersex conditions are subclinical, meaning they will never have a reason to be diagnosed. Um, and so the fact that we don't actually check sex might in fact be a real problem. So we need to grant that it's likely the case that even in our studies where we are distinguishing by sex, there's likely some intersex folks getting in there, right? Just statistically, it is the case. And But exclusion also, the exclusion of intersex people from folks also raises these important ethical, political, and epistemological issues for research, right? Immediately, there are issues around justice here, about if we are just excluding a group of people from research out of course, what does that mean regarding their health needs, their concerns? For example, you know, might it be the case that people with certain kinds of intersex conditions themselves have a particular kind of, um, uh, you know, set of outcomes for system symptoms of heart attack, right? Um, further, it's important to point here that while I say that biomedical research generally excludes intersex studies or intersex subjects, it's important to note that intersex people are nonetheless extensively studied. So most intersex kids are part of some study or another. Um, most intersex adults I know have been part of many studies over the course of their lifetimes. And often these studies are first done to provide evidence to support, support surgical sex assignment in infants, right? The standard treatment model for intersex conditions remains uh, sex surgical sex assignment um, in early infancy. And so a lot of uh, the majority of studies of intersex kids aim at looking at uh, psychosexual outcomes in order to attempt to predict gender, right? So that we can try to as surgically assign sex in a more evidence-based and a more reliable way, even though it's important to note that future gender cannot be accurately predicted for anyone, whether they have an intersex condition or not. Right. So it actually, I think, raises and I say that because I actually think it raises important, again, ethical, political, ep epistemic questions about that kind of research. Further, a lot of the research that's done on intersex people is done in particular kind of just like increase our knowledge about abnormal and normal sex and gender development. Right. To kind of like better, better cash out our understanding of the steroidogenesis pathway that Julia showed us earlier today, right? To kind of do this kind of research to further our understanding of these underlying pathways. But very rarely does this research actually aim at improving health outcomes for those with intersex conditions, right? Um, and I wanted to just kind of point out here, for example, I am lucky enough because of my work that I happen to personally know a lot of intersex folks, and uh, they talk to me about the stuff that's going on with them. And I know for at least a group of them right now who are kind of currently in their 40s are moving into this, one of the issues that they are, many people I know are dealing with is that their endocrinologists don't know what menopause should look like for them, right? Uh, like what should their hormone profile, like what would a normal menopausal hormone profile look like for them? What should treatment, like what should hormone replacement look, therapy look like for them if they should be doing it at all, right? And they're just having to kind of wing it, right? They're trying to figure it out along with their clinicians. Further, I think it's worth pointing out another issue that I know many intersex folks deal with. And like, if we are doing work research about like improving the conditions of intersex folks' lives, one of the issues that I will say I know personally, uh, many intersex folks deal with is issues around access to birth control. Because they've been sterilized as part of their sex assignment, they often need birth control in order to initiate um, initiate puberty or in order and in order to kind of maintain their secondary sex development over their lifespan. But in the United States, it's particularly difficult to get birth control depending on where you live. 
right? And for a lot of companies, many folks will go to like online companies to try to get birth control um, mailed to them from other places in the country where it's more available. But often those kind of comp private companies that are doing like HERS, for example, um, they're only able to issue birth control for very specific reasons. And issuing it to a 17 year old for hormone replacement therapy is not one of them because we think that hormone replacement therapy is something that menopausal people receive, right? Not 18 year olds. Um, so all of this is to say, I think there are a lot of kind of very serious uh, and, and a, a wide variety of kind of important ethical and political and epistemological issues around research specifically for those with intersex conditions and with their inclusion and exclusion from research. And it just points to the ways in which we need to take account of the complexity of se biological sex. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is a, a fascinating talk. Uh, we already have uh, several questions, but again, um, if you have questions for either Dr. Serrano or Dr. Clune Taylor or both of them, please put them in the chat or the Q&A and uh, we'll try to get to those. Um, I guess this question is sort of for both people and it's a big one. And that is how should we be defining sex? Is sex a collection of traits and um, who decides that? I, I guess in most studies, sex is um, self-reported. And as Catherine pointed out, nobody's really checking on these things. So what can we do to make research more rigorous in defining sex? Julia, do you want to jump in first? Um, I can go either way. <laughs> How about you go first? <laughs> okay, sure. Yeah. Um, I often tell this story, um, and I might have added this to the talk if uh, there's a little more time, in because I show all the different you know, these are the different sex characteristics that we have and how people sort of like lump them all together and make a lot of assumptions that, you know, usually if if you're a doctor and someone comes into your office, you're often, I mean, you might have their chart, but if they're a new patient, you're just assuming that they're male or female. And I think that with a lot of research studies, it might be self-reported or it might just be, you know, people based upon what they're seeing. And as Catherine was saying, you know, we we can't see people's sex chromosomes, right? <laughs> so there's this assumption that, oh, well, you appear female to me or you wrote, you checked the, the F box here. So they go by that. Um, but anyway, the anecdote that was, it stuck in my mind and also since Catherine mentioned COVID, in the very early days of the pandemic, people were talking about um, that the COVID was more severe in men relative to women. It was one of the disparities that was found. And I had multiple people in my life, knowing I'm a biologist and a trans woman, ask me my thoughts about that, also often with concern, like, are you concerned? And the assumption was that, well, you know, it must be that you're XY chromosomes, even though I, like the vast majority of people, have never had mine checked. So my genetic sex is yet to be determined. <laughs> um, but my answer to them was, I have no idea what it means that, that, you know, the, that sex difference, because it could be because of hormones. So if it's related to hormones and I'm on estrogen, then I'm protected. But if it's chromosomal, then maybe I'm not. And I ended up a couple of years later looking at the research literature to, to figure out, oh, I wonder what it turned out to be. And all the papers that I saw addressing it largely agreed that it was partly due to hormones um um because with estrogen having a protective effect through the immune system um and part of the reason they know that is because actually when they looked more at the data postmenopausal women didn't uh have that same uh protective advantage um and then the other aspect of it was like completely behavioral 
<laughs> just the fact that men as a general rule tend to take more risks and or are in occupations that would put them in more hazardous situations with regards to the situation. So <laughs> the, the idea that the average person was hearing these news stories and assuming it had to do with sex chromosomes when it actually had to do with two completely different factors um, really draws that home. So I don't know if there's a, a very mm. easy answer here, but I would say if you're doing research, you should definitely try to make very clear what it is that you're studying, whether you bother to look at sex chromosomes, whether it's based on a person's gender identity and so on. Um, so yeah, I think just being more specific um, in the things as far as how to define biological sex or in society, well, basically an everyday, in, with regards to everyday interactions, we're basing it on like a few visual cues. And uh, anyway, so I mm -hmm. think that, I think that recognizing that diversity, and I think this is why more and more people are understanding that um, recognizing people's gender identities. I don't think that this is necessarily uh, a trans specific thing um, because we all have gender identities. And in a world where there are all these different facets, asking someone, well, how do you identify is actually a really important um, social factor that's relevant in everyday interactions. So um, mm -hmm. those are some thoughts. Yeah, if I could add anything there, I, I agree completely. Um, I think it's about specificity. And I think we have to actually take each kind of research project, project by project, such that each kind of group is going to need to decide how are they defining sex based on what it is they're looking for, right? Like what makes sense for their epistemic goals? Um, a similar issue happens in biological research around species um, because there isn't there isn't one uh, clear, clean species concept that I that actually works with all groups. And so you have to you end up and and various kind of research groups end up having to use the species concept that works for them based on what it is that they are trying to study and what makes sense. And so I think it's more about you need to pick something and be specific and you need to justify why you're picking this over something else, but also grant that it's a process, right? It might not get you the thing that you want. It might turn out that, yeah, you're looking at things that are kind of gendered behaviors rather than sex specifically, right? Um, but I think that's the issue more to me about, you know, being specific and is it, do you have a justification for it that makes sense with regards to what your, whatever your epistemic goals are? So, so that definition could, could vary, I guess, then if you're talking about a research study, uh, you know, uh, would you have to do something more than self-report? And if you're doing self-report, um, you know, how do you separate the sex versus gender or gender identity? Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, the boxes mm -hmm. right now are either, you know, male, female, other sometimes, or it may ask for, you know, how you identify as a man or a woman or other, mm -hmm. and sometimes allows for self-report. But, you know, I have personally never seen a box for intersex. Mm -hmm. I suppose if mm -hmm. you are studying intersex, then, then that would be a box that would be included. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, and and I guess how should folks who are intersex mm -hmm. um, be included in research? Are there mm -hmm. enough of them to get the statistical power that you need mm -hmm. to make any sorts of yeah. decisions? That's a that's a great question. Um, and I think it it. So I'll say a few different things here. I think in terms of including intersex people in research, I think really there should be a, a reason. Now there might be good reasons to ex exclude them, but I think in the same way, like we need to justify that, right? So if I'm looking at a study uh, and I am defining men, uh, so I'm trying to study men versus women and I'm making my distinction based on XX and XY chromosomes. So those who have two X's are in this group, those who have an X, Y are in this group. 
that's going to include some intersex folks, right? Like they, there are definitely intersex folks who fall into those categories, right? Now, you might want to exclude them because you might say, okay, but also a, one of the variables here is hormone ratios. And so for some intersex folks with XX chromosomes, they're going to have different kind of hormone ratios than what I'm using like XX as a proxy for here. And I actually think if you're in that position, then I'm like, then maybe you're defining sex by sex by hormone ratios and not chromosomes, right? Um, it might be that you're actually, what you're interested in involves both, right? Like does involve a relation between the, the chromosomes and the hormones, and that might make sense. But I actually think you really need to kind of think about First, don't assume that intersex people would be excluded out of course from whatever your account of men and women are. But furthermore, if say you are using XY, and I think this speaks to your other point here about like, so what kind of boxes should there be? I think we need to have a lot, right? In part because we might be thinking about biological sex. We might, that might be important, but we grant that there are people with a variety of different gender identities that fall into that bucket of having the biological sex trait that we're looking for or of interest to us. And so it might be that we have like options for reporting your sex and reporting your gender. And we have a bunch of varieties for each. And it might be though that we also do want to check. And now it might not be we want to check for everyone. But I do think it is an interesting thing to me, actually, that we often just sort people by sexes um, based on self-reporting. And we think it's actually pointing to very important like biological variables that we're grouping, right? Or like relevantly relevant differences, but we're not actually checking that they exist, right? Or, or actually exist in our group. And so it's not clear to me, like, do we want to check the sex chromosomes of everyone in our study? We might not, but we might want to do a sample of them. Um, and so I do think that that's an issue. I think now thinking about, um, inter I will say like for intersex folks, there are a lot of studies on intersex folks that are just on intersex folks. And uh, I think that's kind of questionable in itself sometimes. Um, but I think often bigger questions I have here in relation to that are um, what is what are the aims of that research? Do we think they're ethical? Do we think they're actually supporting that population or that community? And I would also say I do think there are issues here about like um, what do we think the empirical research can do for us in terms of answering ethical questions about the treatment model? Uh, I think that's a, actually a whole different set of debates. Um, or discussions, I don't think they are related to each other, but so I think we need to think about like, what is the, what is the research doing there? Um, we have a couple of questions here about the implications of translating uh, sex specific research from non-human model organisms to humans. Um, how should researchers discuss the sex? Uh, obviously, you can't know what the gender identity of a, of a research animal is. Um, you know, how, how should that be discussed and um, how should that be translated when you are trying to make inferences about human biology from animal models? Yeah, I mean, I would, sure, yeah. Um, I. In general, I, mean, I think it depends, but I think the first thing is to take everything that's a non-human animal study with a certain grain of salt. I know that a lot of the, um, uh, Catherine was referring to the um, androgen-centric like uh, brain organization models uh, that persisted, have persisted for many, many decades. Um, and a lot of those are based on animal studies of, well, this happened in rats, so, we pretty much think the same thing must be happening in humans, right? And it turns out with humans that humans can talk about different dimensions like sexual orientation and gender expression and gender identity as being different things um, in a way that, as you said, with a with a rat, you can't do that. So I think that 
I think it's fine to do that research. And I think there are things we might learn from that research, but it should always be taken with, um, you know, in that context of some of this might apply, but some of it might not apply. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, I think you should always really kind of take those, those um, or the attempt to like extrapolate to humans with a real grain of salt, especially when we're thinking about things like gender and sexuality, um, because we recognize that they're so um, uh, developmentally affected by cultural and environmental context, right? So to, to go from saying something like these kind of effects of hormones on, um, you know, mounting that we see in female rats translates to things about like gendered behavior and gender identity in humans, I think it's a bit of a leap, especially because not only is it kind of culturally and environmentally constituted, but we are able to kind of self-reflect, right? Like we might have feelings about our sexual orientation or our gender presentation and, and, and change things or shift things accordingly in a way that doesn't seem to apply to other animals. Um, so I think it's always good to have a little pause about what exactly can we take from that? Um, uh, you mentioned uh, a cultural factor. Um, there are some societies that have more than two sexes uh, mm -hmm. or, or genders listed. Um, you know, how how might those be incorporated and can we get um, perhaps another another term or terms that would be more inclusive yeah um i don't know that there's one specific answer to that um as we were saying before with the idea of like if you have multiple different boxes besides male and female that people to check um, or or can state different identities. And that would definitely be a very cultural thing. Like for instance, the word transgender, um, we that's it's a very Anglo-centric concept that when you do go to other cultures, they have other terms for people who we might call trans, right? Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that, I don't think that there's one overarching answer to that question other than mm -hmm. being aware of the fact that people will fall into these non-canonical sex or gender groups um, and taking that into account um, with yeah. regards to that. Yeah. No, I agree completely. I think, so for example, with regards to intersex, there are some places in the world where um, intersex conditions are generally not, um, don't receive surgical intervention. And so there are, for example, some communities where there's a very high frequency and everyone just kind of knows it. And there might be a, a special kind of sex gender designation for those folks. Um, and so I think really what's important here, the question you're, what your question is pointing towards is the need to actually be sensitive to cultural context and recognize that we can't impose our categorizations everywhere that like they are not universal, right? And the fact that we see different communities that have different systems of sex and systems of gender that might include third or even kind of fourth gender options or sex options um, goes to show how socially constructed these things are, right? That there isn't necessarily one clear definition um, and that there isn't, you know, we're never gonna find the one thing that defines sex that, that makes sense everywhere and is universal. Um, we're always doing local work. Um, we probably have time for one more question. Um, one person is asking, are there any best practices for addressing the cis-het bias in research agenda settings and ethical review? It seems vital to ensuring research is truly patient-centered for individuals and groups who are not not cis et. Yeah, there's a lot there. Um, I would say there's yeah. two different things, and Catherine alluded to this with regards to intersex people um, in her talk. I think it's a double problem where, on the one hand, 
trans people and intersex people are excluded from studies that are just generally looking at men and women and we're excluded because we're like a confounding factor in in the researcher's eyes but then we have all this um kind of like an intense amount of research on us specifically as like studying trans people or intersex people and often for instance, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to trans people right now, when it comes to say, accessing gender affirming care, which is something that everybody has, everybody can access cisgender or transgender. Um, there's all this like debate, especially right now in our culture about gender affirming care for like trans adolescents with regards to say puberty blockers or with regards to like um, hormone therapy or um, surgeries for teens. And if you actually look, almost all of those things are happening to cisgender people. Um, cisgender children will go on puberty blockers if they have precocious puberty. You will have um, children have gyno uh, gynecomastia, which is in cis males where they develop breast tissue. And those surgeries are done on cis teens all the time. And yet we like hand ring over it when it regards the trans people. So it's kind of this okay. weird mix of um, this intense focus on us, but ex we're excluded from the general, um, from general care and research. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really agree. So I think, um, I think that's an excellent point, Julia. I, I think we really need to be thinking about there is so much work that I've seen done, particularly lately on trans kids, that is about proving good outcomes for trans kids, right? So being like trying to fight this kind of pushback, this hysteria around trans kids and trans people by showing that, look, folks who have gender affirming care um, are happy, are healthy, we have these good outcomes. And I actually think that's a way of trying to like find empirical evidence for an ethical argument uh, right about like that trans kids should have autonomy over their gendered bodies, right? Um, and in certain ways, I, I appreciate that work being done, but I I actually think like it's in some ways it's just like proving trans people exist. And I often think that what we really need to be doing is talking to trans and intersex people about like what are their health needs, what what actually would be helpful for them for us to do research on. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of intersex folks who, as I said, are just like, I'm trying to find an endocrinologist who can see me through menopause. Cause like, I don't know what's going on with my body. And it turns out no one else does either. Right. Or, um, yeah, issues around like access to care and access to gender affirming care, as opposed to, um, care that really wants to kind of further pathologize having atypical genitalia or atypical sex traits. So I think actually one of the things, the question was like, how do we kind of, um, how do we combat this bias? I would say two things. So I think we need to actually ask trans and intersex people what they would like research about them to be done on. Uh, Cause I, I suspect they would have very different priorities. Um, and two, I think we always need to be thinking about and asking ourselves where are, where are assumptions about sex and gender are happening in the background and just constantly be checking them, right? So if I am distinguishing here between men and women, how am I defining that? Does that actually, actually include some trans people and some intersex people? And it might be the case that perhaps I can't get as many of them recruited as I need to, to have something that's statistically significant or has enough statistical power, but I still will get some information. But even that about the recruit, whether you can recruit enough, I would question that assumption in itself. Okay, great. Well, we'll have to leave it here for now. Um, and we have a break, uh, which I apologize, we've run over our time. So we have about a six minute break now instead of a 10 minute one, but we will re reconvene here at 11.55 Eastern time.